Hi, this is Walter Weesey with Yellowstone Country Fly Fishing and Parks Fly Shop with my weekly fly tying video for June 3rd, 2020. And what I'm going to be doing here this week is a uh, fly that's sort of a variation on a Clouser's Swimming Nymph. And uh, it's a pretty good basic general stillwater fly because it kind of looks like a damselfly or even a leech. Um, I think originally it probably was a hexagenia pattern, but uh, this one you know, it could even be like juvenile crayfish because it's kind of got the, uh, you know, the, the juvenile crayfish claws aren't very prominent. And, uh, you know, I catch warm water fish on this. I catch trout in this on area private lakes. I suspect it might work well in the Madison too, uh, the lower Madison, where we do have a lot of those small crayfish. And uh, tying this one right now because June is definitely peak time for area still waters. And here in a couple weeks, the uh, damselflies will really be out, and uh, that's a lot of fun when you've got size 12 damselflies, you know, first nymphs swimming to shore and then coming back to lay eggs and mate and so forth. And you'll actually see the trout jumping out of the water to eat the adults. And uh, about June 20th is peak time for that, and uh, this year I think that's going to be right before everything comes into play in terms of salmon fly hatch and so on on the Yellowstone. So things are going to be kicking into gear here, and uh, I'd love to book some more trips for June and early July this year. Mid to late July, I'm doing okay. Uh, definitely not as good as usual, but uh, before that, it's real, real grim. So anyone looking for trips here, any any time this season, you know, through uh, through late October, uh, I'd love to hear from you, but especially for the next six weeks. Right, so my hook here is going to be a Dairiki 285, which is a 3x long curve shank nymph hook. And uh, in larger sizes like this, probably anything bigger, certainly anything bigger than a 10, but uh, even down to 12s like this one. This is actually the hook I use for stimulators because you notice it's got the nice round bend here. And um, so the hooking qualities are actually stronger on this hook than they are on a York Bend, you know, Dairiki 270, um, TMCO 200R. Uh, something like that. I, I don't like those hooks at all. I like these round bend hooks. And uh, the, the other hook that I like is a, originally a Dairiki 280, um, which that's a 2x long version of the same hook on a lighter wire. And that's what I would use for smaller stimulators. And Kumoto makes identical hooks. I can't remember the precise uh, designations at this point, but uh, Kumoto basically has Dairiki's tooling and is making the identical hooks. But first thing I'm going to do here is uh, add a little bit of lead wire, not a lot, um, because what I'm put doing there is just putting that right in the middle of the hook shank, and the reason for that is I want that to serve as kind of a, uh, a balance. You know, you've got a lot of wire here in the back of the hook, so normally the hook's going to sink tail first. I'm going to add bead chain eyes, and so... Uh, the uh, it's obviously going to want to sink head first. And while I do want sort of a jigging action, I don't want it to be... Um, super pronounced and so with a little bit more weight there in the middle of the hook that'll actually kind of balance out the speed chain eyes a little bit and you may notice here I'm, I'm actually repositioning that lead a little bit to get that about where I want it mid to ever so slightly forward of the middle point of the hook shank and that, that's one reason I don't wrap my lead wire over a thread base because I do want it you know it's kind of hard to get it set and you know get the thread over it like I just did there but uh, before I do that, it's a lot easier to reposition it, get it exactly where I want it in terms of the balancing act. I'm going to bring my thread here almost but not all the way to the eye, you know, half an eye width behind the eye there, because I, I am going to tie something off in front of that. And I need to pause this for a moment and dig out another pair of lead eyes, or another pair of barbell eyes here. Okay, root, rooting around there, I found my lead eyes, or my brass, my... Uh, uh, barbell or bead chain eyes anyway so just basic bead chain in black and um, I will change the eye size depending on how I want the sink rate of this fly to be and these are this being on 12 these are about as big as I'd go on a 12 anyway I'm gonna come in there and then tie those in on top of the hook shank there not immediately on the eye just give myself a little bit of room there and then I'm gonna finish, you know, I made some X wraps and then I'm finishing by going between the hook shank and those eyes to kind of squeeze everything into place. And then once I'm satisfied with that, make a few more turns, a few more turns, and then do the same thing again. And, you know, lots of thread wraps and then especially these wraps between the eyes and the, uh, the hook shank are what really help bind that in place. And I'm still gonna wind up uh, putting some glue on there in just a moment. Now I'm gonna bring my thread back to the uh, 
well down the bend actually here because I do want the tail on this fly to kind of kick down which when it's actually in the water obviously is going to kick up but uh, I'm going to check that out make sure I've got those eyes square and then I'm going to add some super glue both on the lead wraps you know the thread securing the lead wraps and on those eyes just to make sure everything's locked into place and my tail on this fly is going to be um, kind of a pale olive natural chickaboo and this is one fly where if I didn't have chickaboo I would not use the new bar dyed marabous um, you've got now marabou that's a solid color and then it's actually run through a dyeing machine it's not naturally a grizzly color and I think that winds up being a lot you know, I want the barring on this to be pretty subtle. You know, if you look at that feather, that's not really prominent marking. And uh, those bar dyed feathers are much too prominent for this. And then I'm going to get about that much and then come in here and tie that in. I'm going to strip off some of the fluff there just to make it easier on myself. And I'm going to come in there and just tie that in about like so. Uh, I want a fairly short, I want, you know, I want the tail to, to be able to move here, but I don't want it really prominent on this fly. And you may have noticed actually on the sample fly, I tied it too long to start with, and then I actually broke off some some bits of it. And I think that's entirely okay. You know, if you wind up tying in the, yeah, I wouldn't want to cut marabou, but uh, if you wind up tying it too long, I'll use my my fingernails, you know, thumb and four fingernails to uh, break it. I'm gonna wrap over that feather back up to the lead, and then trim the excess there. And that I did that just to keep things a little even. Now my wire on this fly, my rib, is going to be uh, copper ultra wire in brassy, and I'm just going to pull that out. And I'm just going to go in here right where I finished with that, that uh, tail material. And I'm just going to tie that on the side of the hook shank, basically all the way up and down the hook shank. Uh, I am going to dub over this since I'm not worried about um, you know creating too much bulk or whatever. You know, it's just pretty slim to start with here, and I'm going to just single strand dub it, and so it's going to stay pretty slim. Now my body material on this fly, which is both the uh, abdomen here and the thorax, is just olive hair's ear dubbing. And uh, I'm going to just single strand dub that. And the, the key thing here is get your noodle thin. Uh, you know, that's always good, uh, good advice. But uh, I do want, you know, I want some hair sticking out. Uh, you know, a little fuzz kind of sticking out of the fly, but I don't want this a very thick body for the size of the fly. So I'm going to dub that actually pretty tight because it's naturally going to spit out a few guard hairs and give it a little fuzziness. And uh, as always, you know, you can always add dubbing, so don't add a whole lot to start with here. And I'm going to make a couple wraps right behind that wire to keep that from sliding off the body. And then I'm just going to kind of slowly taper my way forward here, just a very slight uh, body taper and I do need a little more there and it's okay for you to wrap a little bit too far forward on this um, that's better than than not going far enough forward to start with because when I go to tie in the wing case I, you know I'll always uh, I can always wrap back a little bit if I need to over the top of that abdomen all right that's about right I'm gonna go ahead here and make about six turns of my wire now if I went down to a size 14 on this fly, which I would tie this in 10, 12, and 14, the 10 I'd use the same wire, the 14 I'd actually go to a small wire. I don't want a really prominent rib on this fly. And then if you do have any any uh, fibers that are really sticking out too far there, that kind of look unsightly, I just broke those off with my fingers. Now my wing case on this fly, which is pretty unusual, is actually just uh, several strands of peacock curl. Um, and uh, I, what I did there is I, this is actually what I used for the sample fly too, and I kind of squared up those ends, and you could always just cut them to square them up as well. I'm going to come in here and invert that in my vise, and I'm going to come forward a little bit, and this is the hard part. This is, you know, on a natural, a standard clouser swimming minnow is not tied upside down like this. It doesn't have the eyes, and so it's easy enough to tie these in. But here, because I've got that hook point, uh, it can be kind of a pain in the butt to tie these in. And so what I'm going to do there is just make a kind of a gathering wrap and just kind of use the pr thread pressure to position those, you know, what, what is directly underneath the hook and when the fly's actually in the water will be the top of the hook. And then before I go back and get those actually where I want them for the, 
you know, rear portion of the wing case, I came in here with my, my finger, my thumb, and just kind of smashed those around the hook a little bit to uh, give myself kind of a broader profile. You know, I don't want the wing case right over the top of the, the fly. I want it to be spread. You know, it doesn't matter if it's 180 degrees over that, that side of the fly, but uh, I don't want it just a narrow stripe either. And that's about right. So my thorax then on this fly is going to be the same material I used for the body and just a little bit thicker. And again, I'm, I'm going to still wrap that in multiple layers, uh, and so I'm going to dub that pretty tightly and then just start dubbing here. And I don't want it super prominent, but I do want that a little bit uh, thicker than the abdomen portion, and so I'm going to make another layer there. And I'm going to wind up finishing this right in behind my, uh, my bead chain eyes there, because uh, I do have to tie in my legs as well. Uh, a little bit more. You know, it's always always better to be a little bit too thin to start with, and you can always go back through it again. And uh, that looks about right. Yeah, one more. Probably could have made this uh, a little faster if I dubbed a little more to start with here. Okay, there we go. All right. So I'm going to come in with my legs now, and my legs are actually a. Uh, I'll show you the pelt here olive dyed India hen and I've already tied one with this feather and since I'm tying it v-style what I did is I trimmed out the um, well here it is I trimmed out the tip of the feather kind of the center section of the feather and then that left me with uh, you know this is the second one I'm gonna do with it but it essentially looked like that and that's what I'm tying in for the legs and you can usually get uh, usually two flies out of one feather for this purpose about like that's what I want for my legs. And I'm going to come in here, I'm going to strip everything else out there since I know I can't get another fly out of that. And I'm going to come in and right where the feather barbs meet the, uh, the hook shank there, I'm going to come in and tie those in so that they kind of angle down uh, towards what you know would be the top of the fly if it wasn't inverted here. Just like that. And now if you find yourself with no room uh, behind the eyes like I kind of do here, what I like to do then is just go forward to the eyes and then make a couple wraps over the, the hook shank there and then go back and then fold those back. And that way it, it actually creates less bulk uh, getting your sort of uh, fold over method of securing that feather. Um, because uh, obviously I don't want to just trim that without folding it back because it'll just pull out then. And then now the next thing I'm going to do here is just dub a little bit more. I'm going to cover up my thread wraps and then just get the uh, thread up right behind the eyes again. And here, you know, you, you, I could just use the thread. I don't think it matters that much, but, uh, you know, it's always nice to cover up your thread wraps if you can. And I'll just make a couple X wraps around the eyes and then finishing immediately behind the, uh, the hook eye there. And the next step here, I'm going to grab all those peacock curls and then just kind of gently pull those forward and I'm going to, ow, I'm going to cut myself on my hook and you will cut yourself tying this thing. I'm just going to pull those forward and then get a couple thread wraps here. And now because I am pretty tight to the eyes there and with that curve of the eye, it's kind of a pain in the butt to uh, again fold these over time off I'm going to just trim those and that will not hold uh, you know the first time I bang this off a of rock or something those will pull right out but I'm gonna go ahead and whip finish and I've kinda got two choices here for increased durability I would actually coat the uh, that whole wing case with uh, um, UV cure epoxy and then zap it and uh, you know that would be very very Durable, however, then you lose some of the fine motion with the uh, with the peacock. And I'm going to grab the sample fly again here because I did I did coat this one, and uh, you can kind of see the difference there. And so if you want to leave it fuzzy and fine motion, um, leave it as is. And if you want the increased durability for the, for the whole wing case, coat it. Um, but what I'm going to do with this one, just to kind of show the contrast, is just going to come in with 
my super glue here and I do need to put something on there because otherwise those uh, that that peacock is going to pull right out of the tie-in point and I'm a little tight to the eye here but I'm going to just coat everything with super glue and I'm certain I just fill the eye of that hook but what I'm going to do then is just grab my bodkin or in this case just that other fly and just hold that in there for a second moving it around and that'll keep that eye clear and uh, there you have it that's a clouser swimming nymph sort of my variation um, and uh, good warm water fly I might use this here in a couple days in my next warm water trip certainly a very good still water fly when the damsel ha damsels are hatching in the trout lakes around here as well as always thanks for watching and I will see you next week